In today's video, we face our greatest trials yet. Death, destruction, and rebirth. Just when we thought we had it all, fate threw us a curveball. The people spoke and we answered. 500 days is finally here, but at what cost? Join us as we face the music in the mod pack, create above and beyond. You want to play mod packs with friends, but you can't seem to find a good server. And the free ones? With the big mod packs these days, free servers are just too laggy. Luckily for you, there's Bisect Hosting. They host my server, and with plenty of affordable options, they can host your server too. And the best part is, they support almost every mod pack. Use code DOUBLESAL at checkout for 25% off your first order. Bisect Hosting, a great site for great servers. Of all our first days, this one was the most important. If I was going to be rescued from the moon, then Noah needed to act quickly because I was running out of oxygen. Driven by the hope to save his friend, Noah was determined to see that everything would go according to plan. He would be quick, he would be crafty, but above all else, he would remember to bring the shulker box. It was all on him. If we were going to complete these 500 days, then he had to succeed. But you know what? I had full faith in the guy. If anyone could get this job done correctly, it was Noah. I just really hope he remembers to bring extra rocket fuel. Eventually, I could see what resembled a rocket descending from the sky. After being stranded in space, at last, I was reunited with my friend. And unlike me, Noah actually brought the shulker box. The first thing he did was place the gas pad down because I was in desperate need of some oxygen. My pickaxe was also low on durability. So, Noah gave me some manulin ingots and an anvil to repair it. He really came through, because he also brought all the necessary blocks to actually build the rocket pad, that way we could return to Earth whenever we wanted. Now our main goal on the moon was to colonize it. We wanted to establish something of a civilization, so the first task at hand was building a shelter. Out in the middle of nowhere, resources were extremely limited. The only thing we had to build was whatever Noah had in his inventory at the time. Glass and some type of cobblestone. Now this structure was extremely basic. Far more basic than what we usually build, but it by no means represents anything we're gonna strive for on this moon. We're gonna go for grand. We're gonna go for monolithic. We're gonna go for something eternal. But you can't get very far on the moon without oxygen. After we constructed our basic building, the next task was to fill it up with air. The only way to do this was with the block called an oxygen vent. Thankfully, Noah had excellent foresight and brought one with him before he came to the moon. The oxygen vent works similarly to the gas charge pad in the sense that you could put tanks of oxygen and it would fill up. The question was, how were we going to vent the air back out? In our first attempt, we put an energy block underneath the vent, thinking that as soon as we had the energy flowing, the block would automatically turn on. That wasn't the case. After that, we were pretty stumped, until we had the genius idea of actually putting a lever on it and switching it on. And guess what? That's all we had to do. Okay, now we had a way of actually getting oxygen into the room. The room had to be 100% sealed at all times. If you opened a door, if you broke a block, then all of the air would be sucked out and you would suffocate. Well, if we couldn't open any doors, then how were we supposed to get outside? Introducing the airlock. Now, the concept of an airlock is pretty simple. You have two doors and a hallway in between. For example, let's say we want to go outside. All I have to do is open up the door, but the air is not being sucked out because we have a second door at the end of the hallway. Now, as soon as I step into the hallway leaving the space station, the door behind me closes. Now at this point, I should have my spacesuit on because the door behind me is closed, cutting me off from the main source of oxygen. You see how the torch isn't burning? Well, that's because torches can't burn without air, so that's one good way to test if there's actually air in your room. I can now open up the second door and step outside without having to worry about the building losing its oxygen, and that's basically all there is to it. The point of an airlock is to keep the air locked in. We had completed two little mini projects, but we were just getting started. If we were going to do anything else, then I had to make a quick trip back to Earth because there were tons of supplies that we needed. It felt amazing to be back on Earth. There was plenty of fresh air, plus all my stuff was there. I went to the money factory and gathered as many silver coins as I could. There were a ton of things to gather before going back to the moon. I swapped the silver for gold because with the gold, we were going to be buying shulker boxes. We were going to need a ton of storage because we weren't planning on making too many trips back and forth from the Earth to the moon. Now the basic idea was that I was going to stack my ender chest full of shulker boxes, all of which contained everything we needed for our moon plans. With all the blocks I needed, I returned to the moon and began phase two, oxygen production. 
We needed to make as much breathable air as possible. To be honest, the design for this oxygen machine was pretty easy. I just based it off of the one machine we had back on Earth. At the end of the day, all we needed was two holding tanks, a blaze burner, and a basin to mix the zinc and copper sheets. The whole thing was powered with a windmill bearing, which is kind of weird considering that there's no oxygen on the surface of the moon. Now for this to be effective, the blaze burner always has to be burning, so we had a steady supply of coke blocks funneling in. After that, everything worked like a charm. The mixer was mixing the sheets, and it was making oxygen and hydrogen. Eventually, we were going to run out of coke blocks, and we needed a way to keep the blaze burner constantly fueled, so it was time to make a tree farm. I added a second oxygen machine next to the tree farm because the saplings can't grow without air. This is where things got a little tricky because it's very difficult to fill a space like this with air. The tree farm was a fail. I decided to take a little break from my oxygen endeavors. Instead, I focused my attention towards building the space base. In order to build this as quickly as possible, I decided to split the base into three sections. Using my schematics, I then determined the best possible place to put the base. Thank god the Create mod offers a preview, because at least you have an idea of what it's gonna look like. What followed was one of the longest building sequences we have ever done on this mod. There were three cannons, all firing blocks at the same time, with one goal. To build up this massive space base that took me one week to design. To be honest, there really wasn't a lot to do on the moon aside from building the space base, so I spent a good chunk of my time on standby making sure that the cannons had all the blocks they needed. Every once in a while, I'd go inside and tour the partially constructed building just to see that everything was coming along nicely. I decided to step away from the space base, let the cannons do their thing. We were gonna need lots of air still because if we weren't gonna be pumping the air, we still needed the oxygen tanks to refill our spacesuits. I ended up building this massive multi-mixing oxygen machine. Don't let its complicated looking design overwhelm you. Essentially, I just built multiple oxygen machines and connected them all together. We had multiple mixers, multiple basins, and a lot of blaze burners that needed to be fueled. When powered on, this machine would produce more oxygen than we could inhale in a lifetime. But such a machine needs a lot of fuel. These blaze burners needed to be burning at all times. There were no trees, which meant that using logs was going to be difficult, especially since we couldn't grow them. So we decided to look down. Right underneath our feet was one of the best fuel sources for blaze burners. I'm referring to lava. And there was a lot of lava down there. It was simply a matter of how we were going to get the lava from the bottom of the cave into the blaze burners. Well, the first step was actually bringing it up to the surface. We would use a hose pulley to do that. The next step was designing a means of distributing it evenly amongst the blaze burners. We would accomplish this with buckets that would get filled with lava every time they passed a spout. The buckets would then circle around the conveyor belt, entering a funnel which was connected to a deployer. The deployer would then take the lava bucket, pour it into the blaze burner, and then it would drop the bucket back on the conveyor belt, where it would circle around and get filled with lava again. At last, we finally had automated oxygen, which was a massive breakthrough considering that we were on the moon. Meanwhile, the schematic cannons were hard at work. Our tower was finally beginning to rise from the ground. Day after day, night after night, blocks were being placed 24 hours, 7 days a week. It was only a matter of time before our space base would finally be complete. At last, we had finally reached the pinnacle of cubic creation. A stellar structure amongst the stars. The tower casted an imposing shadow over everything we had built. Its grand interiors had plenty of space to build anything our hearts desired. And don't even get me started on the views. This place was magnificent. The space tower would act as our new headquarters. From here on out, all of our future projects would begin here, inside of the building. I mean, hey, we did have the room for it. I decided to take a little tour around the tower, and I was very happy that I decided to make the rooms extra big, because jumping around with little to no gravity, well, you're gonna be bumping your head on the ceiling. Thankfully here, that wasn't the case. I even outfitted the tower with working elevators. Now that I actually had a chance to walk around and explore the interior, I was beginning to question whether or not the tower was too big. I mean, there was no chance we were gonna fill this whole thing with oxygen. Whichever window you looked out of, there wasn't a bad view. You could see for miles the barren wasteland that was the surface of the moon. My favorite room was this grand reception area. It had a giant window that peered out into the stars. On the lower level was a second elevator. That's the one Noah took to meet up with me because he had yet to explore the interior. But wait, there's more. There was a third elevator, and this one was a special elevator. 
It provided access to the highest point of the space tower. It was here in this grand observation room where Noah and I would live. We were going to make this our new home. There was more than enough space for both of us. And just for fun, I even decided to make a little throne room. In the end, it finally felt good to sit in my own chair and just admire everything that we had done. Our next goal was to convert the tower into a functioning factory. So Noah and I decided to reconfigure our rocket ship. Instead of making two trips with two different rockets, Noah and I were just going to make one big rocket that we could ride together. We admired the tower one last time before returning to Earth. Our ambitions were without limits. Now some might consider that a bad thing, but at this point, Noah and I, we were kings of industry. It would take an act of God to stop us now. We entered the rocket, gazing upon our crown jewel during liftoff. Little did we know that that was the last time we'd see it. You see, all it takes is a single mistake. Just one for life to come crashing down. The lesson of the day? Always watch your step. All of it, gone. Just like that. One misstep. That's all it took to reduce the entire city to rubble. The clock tower, the berry farm, every single factory that we had worked on. Nothing more than a husk of their former selves. To make things worse, our bed was broken. So Noah and I had to travel some weird distance. I don't know what it was. Maybe it was because we just came from the moon, but it took way longer to get back than it usually should have. When we got there, it was surprising to see that almost everything was beyond recovery. And Robert... <laughs> well, he was nowhere to be seen. Now usually I would have guessed that he hacked or something to get all that TNT, but with the create stuff that we left behind, it wasn't that difficult to mass produce gunpowder. I mean, we already had a machine that could do that. He was obviously still on the server because we could see that he was still online. I swam to his corpse to check the inventory. When all of a sudden, I heard a rumbling, a familiar rumbling that could only belong to one thing. By the time I got back to shore, I saw a rocket leaving the world. And the rocket's pilot? Take a wild guess. I know he didn't have the resources to build that, so obviously he stole the rocket that we came in. Not to mention the spacesuit he was wearing, so he obviously looted our corpses. We were stuck on the Earth with no way to get to him. Well, we're back to square one. But you know what? This is probably good for us. Everybody needs a fresh start once in a while. If we were going to have our revenge, we needed to invent things Robert didn't know about. He knew about everything in Create Above and Beyond. But not in Create Astral. So I migrated the world over. We needed a humble pickaxe at- What? This was going to be a problem. On top of losing everything, we had to relearn it all as well. I wasn't going to live in the ruins of our old city. He knew where we lived, and I couldn't take a chance of losing it all again. So, we had to relocate. We had officially fallen from technological grace and entered a new dark age. Thankfully, we were still masters of Tinker's Construct, so we could find a way to work around that weird crafting recipe that didn't want to give us our pickaxe. I put together the most primitive tool you could make with this mod. A wooden pickaxe. I finally had a tool, which meant I could finally get to work. And as soon as I gathered that cobblestone, I instantly swapped out the pickaxe for a better one. We had a lot of catching up to do, which meant that we needed to get as many resources as we possibly could. We needed tin, we needed copper, we needed iron. Anything that could be melted down and molded into a machine, we needed it. With the few resources that I had, I packed my things and I moved on. I was not going to live in a snow biome. One of the more interesting things I came across were these wolves that were natural-born inventors. Look at their little goggles. Another day was coming to a close, but I did find myself a spot. It was here in the spruce forest that we would establish a new period of progress. 
And like many of our great projects of the past, I began chopping down as many trees as I possibly could. I laid the foundation of our new settlement atop a hill. While it was certainly no palace of progress like the one in our industrial paradise, this little log cabin would have to do. And you know what? I'm perfectly fine with that. This cabin was pretty cozy after all. I completed the cabin. Then all of a sudden, Noah emerged from the tree line. This was the first time I had seen him since the fallout. Who would have thought that we needed to reunite twice in this video? I went back to work and discovered that nothing in this mod is what I thought it was. I didn't even know how to craft a furnace! Our first task was to gather the essential materials. To get a simple workshop started, we were gonna need clay and andesite. We also needed some tin and copper to make some of our first machines. In this mod pack, copper is king. Not only can it be used for tools, but it can also be used for weapons. Like the one being used by my skeletal friend who tried to do away with me. Noah came back from a little expedition, and he brought back some interesting items including some much needed andesite, as well as a strange looking block. Some type of machine that I had never seen before. One of the many benefits of copper, which I wish they had in vanilla, was that you could actually use it to make armor. Not only that, but you could also use it to make tools. Now at this point, Noah and I were finally somewhat geared up, but we still didn't have any proper weapons. At least that was the case until I stole this thing from a skeleton. I then went to go show Noah what I had discovered. Now the next problem to tackle early on was the matter of storage. There was a type of sorting system called a storage unit. We could also craft these boxes known as packages, and like a regular chest, you could store stuff in them, but when you broke them, they retained their inventory, kind of like a shulker box. The only downside was that there was only one inventory slot in each package, which means you had to dedicate an entire box to one item. The final task of our introduction to this new mod pack was to create an andesite compound. Clay nuggets and andesite, that's what you needed. Then you took the compound, put it in a furnace, and boom, andesite alloys. Much easier than the entire factory we dedicated to making the one item. The next task was to create bronze. All we had to do was mix copper and tin on a smithing table. And then we took the bronze, put it in a stone cutter, and made bronze sheets. We needed it to make cogwheels. And above and beyond, they were made out of wood. So the fact that they're now made out of bronze means that they are way more expensive to make and all the more precious to have. But I will give them this. They look much better than they did before. As for the andesite casing, all we had to do was take our alloy and right-click a log, and boom! Instant andesite casing. It was time to do a scientific speedrun, but before we went any further with our machines, we needed to make our weapons! If we were gonna take back our industrial paradise, then we needed the means to do so. With that out of the way, it was time to quickly put together a workshop. Only this time, it wouldn't take us nearly as long, because now we knew what we were doing. The only thing that took some getting used to were the new crafting recipes, but aside from that, we were literally able to breeze through this. What once took us a week to do on our first playthrough of Create, now only took a single day. We had every tool we needed to build up our industrial paradise once more. The only thing that we were missing was our beautiful block, Andesite. For a third time, we had to recycle Noah's wonderful andesite generator machine. We dug to the bedrock level, installed some drills, we even set up some redstone. But for this design to work, we were gonna need a conveyor belt. Which meant we also needed rubber. Thankfully, there were rubber trees, but that wasn't enough. The rubber itself had to be combined with cooked kelp. Before you make rubber, you're gonna need sap. And to get sap, you have to put rubber logs in a millstone. The next step was to go out to the ocean and collect some kelp. Once you have the kelp, all you have to do next is cook it up. Now that you have your cooked kelp, the next step is to actually turn the sap into rubber. You can do this by putting it into a basin and having it mixed up with a mixer. The final step for making the mechanical belt is to take the kelp, take the rubber, combine them all on a crafting table, and there you have it! I installed the belt on the andesite generator. What followed was a long and tedious process of fixing up this redstone. I'm not very good at it. It would generate andesite, diorite, sometimes even granite. After that, I spent some time going to a desert looking for a cactus. We needed the cactus for the green dye because we were going to make glue. Meanwhile, Noah was hard at work planting his crops. When I got home, I began prepping a new work site. While I had been away getting the cactus, the andesite generator was doing its thing. It produced tons of andesite which you could actually combine and compress into a new type of block. Our goal was to make triple compressed andesite. You see, in a regular cobblestone generator, the lava, the water, they touch, and they make cobblestone. But for the one that we were using, the lava and water, they're meeting over bedrock, which means they can not only make cobblestone, but also granite, diorite, and andesite. 
The only problem is that the chances of andesite spawning are pretty low. But we can increase those chances to 100% if the lava and the water meet over triple compressed andesite. Now you're probably wondering what that big contraption was. That was our andesite alloy machine. And one of the next steps to completing it was by adding some Tinker's Construct blocks. We put together some grout, cooked it up, and made some seared bricks. Because we made so many grout blocks, we were awarded a ton of items, including a sniffer egg. Now, I'm not entirely sure what this mob does, but at least we had one, so it went into Noah's animal pen. Now, by this point, we had unlocked the second chapter, which meant that things were gonna get a little more complicated. Thankfully, we had already accomplished some of the goals, like making a small tinker setup and creating triple compressed andesite. When I collected the block to get the achievement, I was awarded eight blocks of andesite alloy. We had the seared bricks, which meant it was time to make a puny smelter. I looked at the recipes and saw that we had everything we needed. I took the copper, smashed it into sheets, and then I prepared the seared bricks to be mixed with the sap. This would create the brick blocks. Now, I don't know why we needed sap for this recipe, but I'm guessing that it acts as some type of glue, some type of binding to bring the bricks together. Once we had our brick blocks, putting together the small smeltery setup was pretty simple. I worked through a rainy night to ensure that the small smeltery was gonna be complete. We needed to wrap up our andesite alloy machine quickly. Now, you're probably wondering why we needed the setup to begin with. Well, we needed to melt down the gold. Why? Well, we needed a gold ingot cast. You see, the cast was like the last missing piece of the puzzle for this machine to run properly. All we needed now was a means to power it. Once again, we were gonna look to wind power. In these early stages, wind power can't be beat. I put together the windmill bearing, and while I usually would use wool for the blades, I was gonna have to make sails if I wanted the achievement. Thankfully, Noah had been breeding plenty of sheep, so that wasn't gonna be a problem. I crafted the sails, and then I began placing the cogs to make sure that everything would be connected and running in sync. With the help of some gearboxes and mechanical belts, this complicated machine was finally put together. The blades installed and the windmill running, the machine was now producing andesite alloys at a steady rate. Here's how it works. To make andesite alloy, you need an andesite compound. And for that, you need andesite, iron nuggets, and clay. The first issue to tackle was making andesite. Do you remember the triple compressed andesite block? Well, it was doing its job. Lava and water were touching over the block, and they were producing andesite with a 100% success rate. A fan would then blow the andesite block into the hopper, where the andesite would then be moved into a storage unit. Next was the issue of tackling clay. For this process, we only needed a regular cobblestone generator. The block would be broken by a drill, and then it would be funneled down a chute into a millstone. The millstone would grind the cobblestone up and turn it into gravel. The gravel then passed through a storage unit, which acted like a hopper. In the second millstone, the gravel would then be ground up into sand. The sand would then pass through a second storage unit and onto a depot. There, the sand would be washed by a mechanical fan until it was converted into clay. It would go down into the last storage unit, where it would be stored with the rest of the clay balls. The last and final item we needed was iron nuggets, and that began with a third cobblestone generator. The cobblestone would be broken and fall into a millstone. It would be ground up into gravel. The gravel was then moved to a depot, where it would be washed by a fan. When you wash gravel, you get one of two things, either an iron nugget or flint. We had the andesite, we had the clay, and now we had the nuggets. The last and final step was combining the three in a basin using a mixer. The mixer would automatically activate mix it all up, and pour it down into the gold cast we had made. Once the andesite alloy had solidified, it was then deposited into a crude storage unit down below. There you go! Automated andesite alloy. A complicated machine, but I am grateful to the YouTuber who designed it. The next step was more of a cosmetic choice, but it did serve a practical function. We needed to conceal the entire machine because it looked ugly. I began with a cobblestone base and surrounded the whole thing in one wooden box. I then connected this new building with the bridge that was attached to our first cabin. The bridge now connecting both of our buildings, I could take a quick shortcut to see the new factory. The only problem was that I couldn't build a roof. The windmill was just too big. Before I demolished the windmill, I began placing stairs to act as the frame for the roof. Once I couldn't build any further, the windmill came down. What followed was a fun little building session. I wanted this place to feel like home, so I took the windmill blades and I fashioned them to resemble our old windmill back in the industrial paradise. Now resources were running low, and remember, copper is king, so what if you could automate it? Well, you could. And to do that, we needed a block called Viridium. 
To make it, you just needed to pour lava over seared stone. But to make seared stone, you needed to pour molten clay over regular stone. So once again, it was time to rig up a bunch of millstones because we were gonna be grounding cobblestone into gravel to make clay. When you ground gravel up, you make sand. And when you wash sand, you get clay. So it was time to begin this long process. I just copied what we had done on the andesite alloy machine. I connected the new machine to the already running windmill. That way, the andesite alloy machine and the viridium machine could run on the same power source. Everything was coming together. The only thing I underestimated were the number of millstones I was gonna need. At the beginning, I started with a simple pair of millstones, but we were gonna need way more. Once everything was connected, the last thing I needed to do was install some cobblestone generators. With the cobblestone being produced, I added a trio of drills. That was the last thing we needed because the clay machine was now complete. It was time to move on to phase two. We were gonna build a really big smeltery because I intended on producing a ton of clay. To make the smeltery, we first needed to dig underneath the clay machine. The setup would be comprised of multiple storage units, the smeltery itself, and a series of mechanical belts. So we really needed the space. The seared stone machine was finally complete. It began in the first section, where cobblestone was being drilled and ground up into sand. Like the other machine, the sand would head down into a depot where it would be washed and converted into clay. The clay then ended up in a storage unit where it would move down into a conveyor belt. The belt would move the items down into the smeltery where they would be melted into molten clay. Phase two began in a second cobblestone generator. Stone would be drilled, and then it would move down to a furnace fan that we had installed, searing it into regular stone. Our stone blocks would then move into a series of storage units where they would be held. The storage units would then move them into a basin, which would automatically pour onto them the molten clay. With the stone and clay combined, we had finally produced seared stone. It was time to move on to phase two, viridium production. And for that, we were gonna need lava. I wanted to automate lava like we had done in the previous world. To do this, we needed to reinvent pumps and pipes and anything that was used for handling fluids. All the more reason to automate copper because these recipes were expensive. I flattened down what little copper we had left to make our pipes. I then used the rest of the materials to produce our pumps and our storage tanks. It was really good to recover some lost technology because at this point I was feeling very limited. The last and final essential item was the hose pulley. To make it, we needed copper casing, and for that, we needed an assembly line we didn't even have. So I put together a makeshift assembly line. All we needed were two deployers, some rubber, and some copper. I then took a regular andesite casing and ran it through the line three times until we finally had our copper casing. With that out of the way, I was able to craft the hose pulley, the beautiful block that we had used multiple times for our last infinite lava source. Now the goal was to pump lava from the nether, but to make a nether portal you need diamonds to break the obsidian. So I went down into the caves to begin a mining expedition. You needed a mechanical drill to break diamonds. An iron pickaxe wouldn't work, it had to be a drill. Once I had collected my diamonds, I began to ward off an army of hostile mobs. Thankfully, I was armed. Now I did leave some diamonds behind because there was a way to apply fortune on your tool with tinkers. But to do this, we needed a tinker's anvil. Thankfully, I had some bronze lying around, and while it was a little expensive, I think this was a pretty important investment. With the Tinker's Anvil crafted, it was time to make a new pickaxe, one with the capability to turn one diamond into many. I began by making all the necessary casts to pour the metals into. Once I had all the parts I needed, made of iron of course, I then combined them in the Tinker's Anvil to make my base item. Now in Tinker's, the fortune effect is actually called luck. And to apply it, you need to surround your tool with multiple lapis blocks, as well as blue dye. At least for the first level of luck. I then applied the diamond to ensure that we could mine tougher ores. With my one level of luck, I went back down to the same vein of diamonds and mined the rest. And just because I had luck on my pickaxe, I was able to double the amount of diamonds I originally would have gotten. I then went to go mine some obsidian for our lava machine. I built the portal, lit it up, and I stepped inside only to discover something that I had no idea would be a problem. Yeah, in this mod pack, there is no nether. So that was a big waste of time, but we did have a plan B. I went to a geo to mine some calcite, and with the calcite, I combined it with water to create dripstone blocks. I then crafted some cauldrons, and I was gonna put it all together because instead of pumping lava, we were gonna generate it. I began clearing the stone where the portal once stood. 
I placed down the cauldrons and began making a channel for the lava to flow through. Now for those of you who don't know, you can actually generate lava with dripstones. All you have to do is have a lava source block right above a dripstone block. After that, the dripstone will start dripping lava into the cauldron. It's only a matter of time before the cauldron gets full, and after that, all we need to do is pump the lava out. Inside of the same cave, I built some fluid tanks. I then decided to connect the fluid tank to the smeltery. That way, that thing could constantly keep melting clay. By the time I had figured out how to set everything up and connect all the pipes to all the machines, the cauldrons had filled up. The final task was to get the pipes up and running. Eventually, lava started pumping into the tanks from the cauldrons, and from the tank, it went into the smeltery. Though I did want to produce more lava, so I built a second setup right next to the original. But what about the Viridium? Well, we were gonna need lava for that too. I then began clearing a second cave to build another smeltery. It would be here where we'd finally produce our Viridium, the source of our infinite copper. In this smeltery, we would pump it full of lava. After that, I began experimenting with a ton of crude storage units as a means of transferring our seared stone. The stone would travel from one smeltery to another. Once it arrived at its location, the seared stone would then be inputted into the casting basin. Lava would be poured over the stone, and this would cause a reaction converting it into viridium. Now that we had a source of this green block, we were one step closer to infinite copper. I took the little viridium that we had generated and I went back to our first little workshop. There I threw the viridium into the millstone where it would be grounded up. Once broken down, the millstone would spit out a nice piece of copper. To finalize everything, I took the crushed copper, put it into the fire, and watched it smelt into a beautiful copper ingot. We were running out of time, so I decided to spend my last few days working on a project that was relatively simple, yet extremely essential. I began by building a stone brick foundation for what would be a raised platform. I then filled the center with dirt. Reason being was because we were gonna make a tree farm. You know what? You can never go wrong with tree farms. I'm not gonna lie. I was really missing the automation of simple blocks such as wood and cobblestone, so I was trying to get back everything that we had lost, including the tree farm. At the end of our 100 days, there was really a lot to reflect on. I mean, we had accomplished so much and lost it all so quickly. We may have experienced a temporary setback, but remember, progress never stops. Now don't worry, we're not gonna abandon the city. I have plans to go back. Although there is one thing I am wondering. What's Robert doing on the moon? Cause honestly, unless he took supplies with him, he's not gonna find much. Unless of course, he does happen to stumble across our space base, but you know what? What are the chances of that happening, right? Right? If we were gonna have our revenge, then we needed to work hard. At this point, there wasn't a moment to lose. If he wants to squat in the space base, he can have it. But it's a pretty cool base. So if you wanna see us take it back from the clutches of Robert, then be sure to leave a like and subscribe for 600 days, because ladies and gentlemen, a war is about to begin. I don't know how we're gonna do it, but I promise you that in the end, we're gonna come out on top. I will see you in the next one, hopefully in a better state of mind. <laughs> this has been Double Sal, thanks for watching.